we're delighted again to have the uh, Dr. Robert Meyerberg Endowed Lecture in Cardiovascular Medicine. Uh, this endowed uh, lecture was established in uh, 2011 through a fundraising campaign uh, to support an annual lecture in the Division of Cardiology at the Department of Medicine at the University of Miami Miller School of Medicine. Uh, former fellows and several grateful patients uh, donated to the endowed fund, uh, which provides us the means to bring our lecturer to, to you today. I believe that this is now the seventh annual Meyerberg Lecture. Uh, we're particularly delighted that uh, Dr. Meyerberg is, uh, continues to work strongly with us. Um, his expertise, of course, is in the field of sudden cardiac death. And uh, as you will see, our uh, invited uh, guest today is uh, particularly appropriate uh, for the Meyerberg Lecture. So thank you. Thank so you. We'll begin. So our, our chief resident will introduce you, Dr. Al Khatib. Sounds good. Dr. Sana Al Khatib is a professor of medicine at the Duke University Cardiology Division who specializes in electrophysiology. She did her medical school at the American University of Beirut, followed by her internal medicine residency, cardiology fellowship, and electrophysiology training at Duke University Medical Center. Dr. Al Khatib has had several leadership positions institutionally, including the present director of the Duke Clinical Research Institute Fellowship Program and co founder and co director of the Sudden Cardiac Arrest Thought Leadership Alliance. From a clinical research standpoint, she has authored or co authored more than 280 peer reviewed manuscripts in several high impact journals, including Circulation, JAMA Cardiology, and the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. Furthermore, she serves as a senior associate editor for Circulation and a reviewer for the New England Journal of Medicine and The Lancet. She has received multiple NIH-based and institutional grants to pursue her research interests, including one trial geared towards increasing bystander rates of CPR in intervention counties compared with controlled counties and to increase the rates of bystander first responder defibrillation prior to paramedic arrival in intervention counties. Importantly, Dr. Al Khatib chaired and was the first author of the 2017 AHA ACC HRS guidelines for the management of patients with ventricular arrhythmias and the prevention of sudden cardiac death. Lastly, on top of all of this, I've heard from a friend who used to be a chief resident here and is now a fellow at Duke that she's an extraordinary mentor and person. A special e welcome to Miami, Dr. Al Khatib. Thank you very much for this uh, amazing introduction. I'm humbled, uh, thank you. And it's truly a pleasure to be with you today and to present on a topic that's near and dear to my heart, namely preventing sudden cardiac death. And um, what I'd like to do today is to highlight some of the many successes that we have had in this field, but also share with you some of the challenges that many of us have, uh, have faced as well. Here are my potential disclosures. It's truly a pleasure for me to um, present in recognition of Dr. Meyer Meyerberg. He has been an icon in sudden cardiac death epidemiology and a role model for many of us in the field. Uh, very thoughtful work that has really uh, advanced our understanding of the epidemiology of sudden cardiac death, risk stratification for sudden cardiac death, including genetics, and um, you know, sudden cardiac death in the athlete. In fact, as I sh shared earlier uh, uh, today, when I uh, gave cardiology grand rounds, uh, one of Dr. Meyerberg's present, uh, 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 publications uh, titled Sudden Cardiac Death Epidemiology, Transient Risk and Intervention Assessment has been cited 715 times. It truly has had a major impact on the field. And it has been a true pleasure and honor for me to know Dr. Meyerberg, to collaborate with him. And really the unique experience that we had working together was uh, working on the guideline document that was mentioned to you. Um, this was the AHA ACC HRS a guideline document for the prevention of sudden cardiac death that I had the pleasure of co-chairing with my colleague, Dr. Stevenson, 
and an instrumental member of this writing group was Dr. Meyerberg. And he truly enriched this experience with his uh, thoughtful input and his devoted uh, effort and time. It truly was a team effort and we had a great time working on this uh, uh, document together. And here's the citation and here we are, we truly were a family working on uh, this uh, guideline document uh, really hard for about 18 months. So I don't think I need to tell anyone in this audience about the public health significance of sudden cardiac death. It is absolutely one of the largest causes of death in the world. If you look at the United States, sudden cardiac death is the most common mode of death, accounting for 350,000 deaths per year. Sudden cardiac death affects every race, sex, and socioeconomic group. And one of the tragic facts about sudden cardiac death is that it is indeed the first manifestation of heart disease in about 50% of individuals. So we really need to work hard to improve the outcomes of uh, patients who are at risk for sudden cardiac death. And if you look at the epidemiology of sudden cardiac death, as Dr. Meyerberg uh, always reminds us of this paradox, I call it a paradox in the epidemiology of sudden cardiac death. You know, where if you look at the incidence of sudden cardiac death, yes, of course it's higher among high-risk groups, you know, people with a low ejection fraction, survivors of cardiac arrest, that is absolutely true. However, if you look at the absolute number of sudden cardiac deaths, you'll see that the majority are actually occurring in the general population. So in people who do not appear to be at an increased risk for sudden cardiac death. So the biggest challenge for us in the EP community and in the sudden cardiac death um, world is how do you identify those groups or subgroups of individuals in the general population who will have a sudden cardiac arrest? So let me here talk about the successes that we have accomplished in this field before I talk more about the challenges that we are facing, including how to identify those high risk patients in the general population. I do believe that the therapies that we have uh, today uh, have been a major success for reducing the risk of sudden cardiac death. And here, I really wanted to highlight medications, many medications for heart failure have been shown to reduce the risk of sudden cardiac death, including beta blockers, um, ACE inhibitors, aldosterone antagonists, and I'll share with you more data on other uh, medications for heart failure that have been shown to reduce the risk of sudden cardiac death. So this is a major advance. Of course, the implantable cardioverter defibrillator is one of the most effective therapies available today for the prevention of sudden cardiac death. And we'll talk a bit more about that. And of course, we have the AED, you know, the uh, automatic external defibrillator that certainly has a major role to play. Unfortunately, that's where I see some hurdles in terms of the deployment and the implementation of AEDs. I'll talk briefly about this later on. And of course, we have the wearable defibrillators that may have a role in uh, small groups of patients. I do want to highlight the results of two pivotal randomized clinical trials uh, that looked at survival in relation to the implantable cardioverter defibrillator. To your left, you'll see the main results of the MADE-2 trial. This trial was published in 2002, so it's been a while, but they enrolled patients with ischemic cardiomyopathy with an EAP of less than or equal to 30%, um, who had a prior MI, and they randomized them to receive optimal medical therapy versus optimal medical therapy plus an ICD. And as you can see here, patients who were randomized to the ICD arm had a significant improvement in their survival with the ICD. 
To your right, you'll see the main results of the SCADHAP trial. That's the sudden cardiac death in heart failure trial. Again, this trial is old now. It was published in 2005. And it enrolled patients with ischemic or non-ischemic cardiomyopathy with an EF of 35% or less who had class two or three heart failure symptoms despite optimal medical therapy and showed that patients with an ICD had better survival, lower mortality here, than patients who were randomized to placebo or amiodarone. And in fact, these two trials have informed practice guidelines for now almost a couple of decades and have informed our clinical practice. I'll be referring back to these results later on in this presentation. But going back to the role that heart failure medications play in the prevention of sudden cardiac death. Now, many of us are aware of ARNI, uh, that's the uh, angiotensin receptor uh, uh, neprilysin inhibitor um, that shows this, or, or entresto, sacubitril valsartan, that showed a significant reduction in the risk of sudden cardiac death with uh, this medication in patients with heart failure. More recently, we have the results of the DAPA-HF trial focused on sudden cardiac death and serious ventricular arrhythmias. This actually was just published uh, this year. And basically in this trial, they took patients with heart failure with or without diabetes, and they randomized them to either get uh, dapagliflozin or placebo on top of other medical therapy. And the trial was positive in looking at the primary outcome, which was all-cause mortality uh, and the heart failure hospitalization, but in this particular secondary analysis, they were able to show that patients who received the Paclifloxin had a significantly lower risk of serious ventricular arrhythmias and resuscitated cardiac arrest. And we will see more data on other heart failure medications that really reduce the risk of sudden cardiac death. So I am pleased to report that in our guideline document, we really, uh, elevated the importance of heart failure medications for the prevention of sudden cardiac death. In all prior guidelines, you know, all recommendations related to ICDs state that patients need to be on optimal medical therapy for heart failure. We do the same in this guideline document. But in our document, we even pushed it a step further by devoting a whole recommendation to heart failure medications where we state in patients with HEPREF, treatment with a beta blocker, an aldosterone antagonist, and either an ACE inhibitor or an ARB or an ARNI is recommended to reduce sudden cardiac death and all cause mortality. Now, all that said, the ICD certainly has a, a role to play. Now, many people are calling for more recent data on the role of the ICD when you use it on top of all these heart failure medications to see if it still has a role, at least in some of the observational studies. We still see a role for the ICD. Will a randomized clinical trial ever be done again in patients who you know, have been shown to benefit from the ICD? Very unlikely, I would say. So we will have to rely on well-conducted uh, and robust observational studies to answer that question. But going back to the guideline document uh, that um, uh, I mentioned earlier that I had the pleasure of co-chairing, the guideline itself is actually organized uh, based on disease states. And um, we really devote, devoted a lot of effort to ischemic heart disease because this is the disease that is most prevalent among patients who experience sudden cardiac arrest, ventricular arrhythmias, what have you. And the guideline is in fact organized where it starts with secondary prevention indications and then tackles primary prevention indications and then uh, also tackles for some disease states recurrent arrhythmias. How do you treat patients who present with recurrent ventricular arrhythmias or perhaps ICD shocks. And I'm not going to delve into the specifics of these recommendations, but I do want to highlight a couple of points. Number one, 
if you are thinking of an ICD for a patient who survived a cardiac arrest uh, or who has experienced uh, VT, be it uh, hemodynamically unstable or stable, it is important to rule out reversible causes. So make sure that you do that before you offer an ICD. But also you'll see that in all the recommendations that we included in this guideline document on ICDs, we require that patients have a meaningful for survival of greater than one year to really offer them an ICD, be it for primary prevention or secondary prevention. And what I mean by that secondary prevention is for patients who already experienced an event, be it a cardiac arrest or a ventricular arrhythmia. Primary prevention uh, uh, is for patients who have not experienced an event, but who due to their heart failure, cardiomyopathy, you know, other uh, conditions are deemed to be at an increased risk for sudden cardiac death. And again, I don't need to delve into those details. I always encourage people to refer to the guideline document if they are you know, faced with a case or a presentation that's unique, that's different. Maybe they want to refresh their memory about uh, what the recommendations are in the guideline document. So the other thing that this uh, guideline document uh, offers is these different algorithms that I personally really like because first of all, I'm a visual person. Um, but second, it really uh, it considers different scenarios that we're able to, that we see in clinical practice. And then can we walk the clinician through these different scenarios in terms of if the patient presents with this, this is how you do, you do it, this is what you look for, so on and so forth. Again, the intent here is not to delve into the specifics, but really to highlight the fact that these algorithms are easy to follow. You know, we uh, assign class one recommendations, the green color class 2A recommendations, a yellow color class 2B, orange, and, and the red is for three, uh, you know, class three recommendations, meaning don't do those. What I'd like to um, focus on next is our team's contribution to the field of sudden cardiac death prevention. And I really want to acknowledge the contributions of all the team that I've worked with over the years. And this really has been a wonderful journey in terms of the things that we've been able to accomplish together, including my mentees and, and the trainees that I've had the pleasure uh, of mentoring. So uh, one important uh, analysis that we did was comparing patients receiving primary prevention ICDs for heart failure slash cardiomyopathy in clinical practice with patients in randomized clinical trials of ICDs. And so the, those were the trials that I uh, referred to earlier, the MADE2 trial, the SCADHAP trial. And the main driver for this particular analysis was after the sudden cardiac death in heart failure trial was published in 2005, the CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, announced their decision to reimburse clinicians for implanting these devices. However, their decision was coverage with evidence development. So they wanted us to uh, provide more information through a national registry so an, a national ICD registry was built and we were required to enter data on all Medicare beneficiaries receiving a primary prevention ICD in clinical practice. And they had a list of questions that they wanted the registry to address. And one of the top questions they had was this number one here. So that's why we took that on. Uh, another thing we focused on is examining utilization of therapies that are effective at preventing sudden cardiac death, you know, mostly the implantable cardioverter defibrillator in the work that we, we've done, and then determining the role of the ICD in patient subgroups, either not included or not well represented in randomized clinical trials. So let me very briefly walk you through these. This is the first analysis that I alluded to uh, that we published in JAMA in 2015. <laughs> We um, looked at the survival of patients receiving a primary prevention ICD in clinical practice that in that national ICD registry that I referred to earlier. And we had access to patient level data from the MADE2 trial and from SCADHAP to conduct this comparative effectiveness analysis. 
And what we were able to find after propensity score matching is that patients who uh, were receiving the ICD in clinical practice had a similar survival to patients who were randomized to the ICD arm in the MEDA-2 trial. And both of these groups had better survival than patients who were assigned to medical therapy in the trial. And we had similar findings in relation to the other trial, the sudden cardiac death in heart failure trial. So this certainly uh, informed um, the, the response to that first question that, uh, that uh, I alluded to earlier, that was actually on top of the list of CMS when they approved uh, uh, reimbursement for primary prevention ICDs. Now, in terms of utilization of therapies that are effective at preventing sudden cardiac death, as I mentioned, our group has really looked at uh, utilization at sex and race disparities in the use of ICDs. And uh, we were one of the first groups to highlight some of these issues with significant underutilization um, reaching only 35% of patients who are potentially eligible for primary prevention ICDs receiving one. And with women and uh, Black patients being significantly less likely to receive this life-saving th therapy. And then, of course, based on all these findings, we uh, formed the Sudden Cardiac Arrest Thought Leadership Alliance uh, that Dr. Grant alluded to. Uh, where we started kind of addressing these issues. How do we improve utilization? How do we uh, uh, address disparities in care? Um, the third uh, uh, field uh, here that we uh, really worked on significantly as a team is uh, determining the role of primary prevention ICDs in patient subgroups not included or not well represented in the clinical trials. And here I want to highlight some of these groups. Uh, one of them was patients with an EF between 30 and 35%. I'll uh, talk about this briefly uh, in the next few slides. You know, what about uh, ICDs in women versus men? We do know that the risk of sudden cardiac death tends to be lower in women. So do women benefit? Uh, of course, you know, uh, uh, racial and uh, ethnic minorities, we know that those Individuals are at an increased risk of sudden cardiac death. So what does that look like in terms of whether they have an ICD versus no ICD in this observation study, obviously. And then, you know, of course, uh, patients uh, who are older and have uh, different uh, uh, comorbidities. So uh, just uh, very briefly uh, talking about that first group of patients, because if you look at the mean or median ejection fraction of patients enrolled in the clinical trials, that was mostly between 22 to 25%. So many people have uh, you know, wondered about the ICD in people with better EFs. So what if the EF is it, you know, still within that category of needing an ICD based on the guidelines, but between 30 and 35%. And so we conducted this and this paper was also published in JAMA in 2014. And again, after uh, propensity score matching, we were able to show that patients with an ICD had uh, better survival than patients with no ICD among that group of patients with an EF between 30 and 35%. And then in reference to ICDs in women, again, uh, we uh, examined patients uh, with uh, ICD versus no ICD and found that women with an ICD had better survival then women with uh, no ICD, we uh, conducted a couple of analyses, uh, one using a Get With The Guidelines heart failure database and one using both the ICD registry and Get With The Guidelines. And the findings were consistent that um, patients who had an ICD had better survival than patients with no ICD. This particular analysis here focused on uh, uh, race and uh, ethnic minority groups and um, really showed that people who had an ICD shown here um, had better survival than patients with no ICD. And this was true of people who were white non-Hispanics as well as of minorities. And then even in this particular uh, study that was published in JAHA, 
in 2015, where we focused on older patients with different morbidities, we were able to find that patients who received an ICD had better survival than patients with no ICD. So of course, you know, the strongest evidence related to ICDs comes from randomized clinical trials, without a doubt. However, there's no question that there are some subgroups of patients that were not well represented in those trials. And it's very unlikely that we will see randomized clinical trials focused on these subgroups. And so these observational uh, data complement what we already know from randomized clinical trials. And so in the guideline document, this was actually one thing we wanted to focus on, older patients with comorbidities. And so uh, what we did is we engaged an evidence review committee that was um, uh, chaired uh, by my friend and colleague, Dr. Fred Kusumoto, where basically they conducted a com comprehensive systematic review uh, to answer that question. Do older patients with comorbidities benefit from primary prevention ICDs? And based on the systematic review that was mostly informed by observational data, uh, we were able to offer this recommendation here as a class 2A recommendation, meaning in most cases do it for older patients and those with significant comorbidities who meet indications for a primary prevention ICD and ICD is reasonable, again, if meaningful survival of greater than one year is expected. And it is important, of course, to take into account shared decision-making, which was an important focus for us in the guideline. And then the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services ended up adopting that in their final ruling. What about patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy? I always like to bring these patients up. First, non-ischemic cardiomyopathy is the second most common cause of sudden cardiac death after ischemic heart disease. And second, because of some controversy around the role of ICD that was uh, uh, ignited by the publication of the Danish trial, uh, that this trial was published in September of 2016, and I will uh, just mention this briefly uh, in the next few slides. But basically, in the guideline, as a uh, class one recommendation for the primary prevention of sudden cardiac death, we tell you that in patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy, heart failure, class two, three symptoms, despite guideline-directed medical therapy, EF of 35% or less, an ICD is recommended if meaningful survival of greater than one year is expected. And you may say, well, we've known that. Well, as we were working on the guideline document, the Danish trial was published, and here it is. And as I said, it really raised questions in people's mind about the role of the ICD in patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. They took patients uh, who had uh, an EF of 35% or less, New York Association class two or three symptoms largely, um, and an elevated nt pro BMP. And they randomized them to uh, receive an ICD plus medical therapy versus medical therapy only, and they found no difference in survival between the two groups. However, it is important to keep in mind, you know, some of the characteristics of these patients, but an important feature of the trial is the fact that they allowed implantation of a CRT device, such that if patients were eligible for CRT, and they were randomized to medical therapy, they received a CRT, that's cardiac resynchronization therapy, uh, with a pacemaker device. If they were randomized to the ICD arm and they were CRT eligible, they received a cardiac resynchronization therapy device with a, de uh, with a defibrillator, and indeed 58% of the patients fit that uh, classification. And so to me, I think of this trial more as a comparison of cardiac resynchronization therapy with a pacemaker versus cardiac resynchronization therapy with a defibrillator. And that's why uh, we really, in our thinking and deliberations, we were leaning uh, more toward not changing that class one recommendation regarding ICDs for patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. And then at that time, 
several uh, groups, including this uh, a publication here from our group, you know, published meta-analyses looking at ICDs in patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy and showing a significant 25% relative risk reduction in all-cause mortality with the primary prevention ICD in patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy. And indeed, after the publication of our guideline, this particular secondary analysis from the Danish trial came out and uh, really showed that there was this 70 years old threshold such that if patients were younger or 70 years of age or younger, uh, it, they had a better survival with an ICD uh, than with no ICD. But this did not seem to be the case in people who were older than 70 years of age. So to go back to that point about older patients and ICDs, you know, perhaps in, in patients with non-ischemic cardiomyopathy age may play a more important role than in patients with ischemic heart disease. As I mentioned earlier, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services approved reimbursement for primary prevention ICDs in Medicare beneficiaries back in 2005 and required us to generate the evidence. And so as we were working on the guideline document, they decided to reopen their decision regarding primary prevention ICDs. And so we actually um, teamed up and published this paper, you know, where to, where to now in terms of their opening uh, their decision. And uh, we provided input, we submitted uh, input uh, through the public uh, comment uh, period uh, to CMS. And I was very happy to see that the work that we did that informed parts of the guideline, and then this guideline document that we worked on with a wonderful uh, team of experts, really had an immediate major impact on health policy because the final ruling for CMS was as follows. They said that they've determined that the evidence is sufficient to conclude that the use of ICDs is reasonable and necessary for the treatment of illness or injury or to improve the functioning. This is how they, they use their wording. And there were really only minimal changes to the initial uh, decision regarding reimbursement. And actually you would see here that uh, they even allowed exceptions to the waiting periods because like for ICDs, we are required to wait for 40 days after NMI, 90 days after revascularization to kind of give the ejection fraction time to improve, give the heart failure medications time to work and, uh, and reassess. But they said that if a patient, for example, needs a pacemaker during this waiting period, it is okay to proceed with implanting a pacemaker defibrillator. Throughout their ruling, they cited the 2017 guideline document. So that was really very rewarding uh, to, to see. Uh, other successes that I see beyond the therapies that I talked about, medications, ICDs, uh, so on and so forth, is really the evolution that we're seeing in genetics and genomics. And this is an area that Dr. Meyerberg has contributed to immensely. And so in the guideline document, we have quite a few recommendations on the importance of genetic counseling, genetic testing. You know, we have a whole section on post-mortem evaluation of sudden cardiac death that Dr. Meyerberg uh, contributed to, also highlighting the importance of you know, genetic counseling, uh, genetic uh, testing. So with that in mind, what have the hurdles been? Now, I did mention the AED as one of the important advances in technology for, you know, here to really treating uh, sudden uh, cardiac arrest and preventing the tragic outcome of sudden cardiac death. And despite the fact that the AED has been an excellent innovation, its use has been pretty low. And it's been really sad to watch the poor outcomes of victims of cardiac arrest. So if you look at the data that have been published, we're still at five to 10% survival rate 
you know, from sudden cardiac arrest. We definitely need to do better in terms of teaching people to be first responders, to use the AED, to uh, deliver quality CPR, so on and so forth. So a lot to work on there. Um, the another area is underutilization and disparities in the use of proven therapies, not just ICDs, but also heart failure medications, other therapies. And yes, we have made some progress, but I do believe that we need to continue to work harder on this to ensure that patients who could benefit from these therapies are indeed receiving their therapies. Um, risk stratification for sudden cardiac death is limited in relation to really identifying low risk patients among the high risk populations. Not every patient who receives an ICD uses it. So how do we identify those patients who won't benefit? And then really identifying these high risk patients among low risk populations. Again, going back to that paradox of the epidemiology of sudden cardiac death that I alluded to earlier in terms of you know, these really absolute numbers of sudden cardiac death events being highest in the general population. And there's of course a need for optimizing the outcomes of patients with ventricular arrhythmias and an ICD. And we are continuing to improve the technology. Now we have subcutaneous ICDs you know, on the market to try in some patients to lower the risk of infection like end-stage renal disease patients or uh, patients with issues with access, things, uh, uh, things like that. So what are the future directions that we are embarking on? Uh, we are happy to be uh, leading a, a clinical trial funded by the NHLBI called the Race Cars Trial. And this is really trying to target improving the care of sudden cardiac arrest victims. So how do we get people to be, uh, to be first responders, to do a great job in terms of CPR, in terms of activating EMS, EMS getting there, how can we improve the outcomes of those patients? So please stay tuned. I'm really excited about this pragmatic randomized clinical trial. Another area that we're working on is the INSPIRE pilot trial that we are conducting within the Duke Health System, where it took us actually about two years to develop and test a clinical decision support tool that we've embedded in EPIC in our EMR to help clinicians identify patients who may benefit from the implantable cardioverter defibrillator from cardiac resynchronization therapy and we are randomizing, oh, we have randomized them actually at this point, um, and we are collecting data as we speak, but 20 clinicians uh, to standard of care versus this clinical uh, decision support tool. And we are going to be looking at um, outcomes of patients at one year. And uh, we have been able to implement the tool and uh, we uh, have proven that it's actually feasible to uh, deploy the tool in an EMR system. And we are uh, hoping to uh, be able to provide more data uh, in terms of the impact of, of the tool. Going back to this paradox that I have referred to, to, uh, to several times during this talk, you know, how do we identify these patients here? And that's where I actually see a place for machine learning for the prediction of sudden cardiac death. And as I shared with uh, my cardiology and EP colleagues uh, this morning, uh, we actually have put together a, a large grant that will be reviewed by the NHLBI here soon, uh, trying to pull in machine learning, trying to uh, pull in molecular profiling, as well as social determinants of health and be able perhaps to uh, create a parsimonious a model for the prediction of sudden cardiac death. And we'll see how that uh, pans out in terms of course, uh, getting the funding, but hopefully if we can get the funding, how we uh, do there. So to conclude, several successes have been achieved in sudden cardiac death prevention. That include better understanding of the epidemiology that Dr. Meyerberg has really contributed to therapies that prevent sudden cardiac death, including medications, the ICD, novel markers of sudden cardiac death risk, you know, genetics, cardiac MRI. I didn't really spend too much time on the cardiac MRI today, but we are seeing more data there that will be helpful. 
However, several hurdles unfortunately remain in relation to you know, optimizing the outcomes of SCA uh, victims, underutilization of proven therapies and inadequate risk stratification. We really need to improve in that regard. With improvement though in SCA care, implementation science and machine learning, major advances can be expected. Thank you very much for your attention. I wanted to end with this um, uh, 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 quote here of all our human resources, the most precious is the desire to improve. Thank you very much. Dr. Al-Khatib, that was a splendid Grand Rounds. Thank you so much for, uh, for your presentation. It was very clear and uh, gave us very, uh, very good advice. I, um, I uh, am interested, uh, we'll, we'll ask Dr. Meyerberg in a second to unmute himself and make a comment, but maybe I can begin as he's getting his thoughts together, uh, ask you a question about the use of various medications and their, uh, and their effect in health, in health disparities. First, of course, is the availability question, but then there's the question specifically about dapagliflozins and whether or not that represents a mechanism of action that's different from the other anti-heart failure medicines that would be more appropriate for, for different groups. Yes, no, absolutely. That's a great question. Thank you. Uh, so definitely a different mechanism of action. These are SGLT2 inhibitors, so dapagliflozin and pagliflozin. Um, and, you know, as you know, they are used for patients with diabetes, but in the trials that looked at uh, uh, these medications in patients with heart failure, patients did not need, uh, you know, need to have diabetes. Uh, our trials are showing improved outcomes uh, in, in relation to all-cause mortality, in relation to heart failure hospitalization, um, and, you know, whether to uh, expect uh, any different effects among different, like, racial groups or things like that. That's a really interesting thought. I think it is important to look at that. Um, you know, obviously the biggest thing is to ensure that randomized clinical trials have good representation of these important groups. I'm sad to report that those trials actually did not have enough uh, racial and ethnic minorities. And that's where I do think that like registry uh, studies, uh, you know, perhaps meta-analyses combining you know, uh, data, if you have access to patient level data on these uh, subgroups of patients uh, would be uh, helpful. Thank you. Of course. Dr. Meyerberg, would you like to say a few words? Uh, well, I think uh, Sana really summarized the um, area very well. Uh, I would emphasize one thing, and, and she mentioned these points, I would just reemphasize them. One is the fact that at least half of all cardiac arrests and sudden cardiac deaths are first cardiac events. So these are in patients who have not had a previous cardiac event, have not had a prior myocardial infarction, they just come out of the blue. The second is that the majority of cardiac arrests uh, emerge from the general population so that it is not the high-risk patients that are hard to identify, they're easy to identify, um, but it is the general population in which, from a risk point of view, the risk is low, from a population numbers point of view, the risk is the highest. And finding subgroups within that general population is the real challenge going forward. Thank you. Anybody else have any questions? Please unmute yourself or raise your hand. Hi, I have a question for uh, Dr. Al-Khatib. It's Jeff Goldberg. <clears throat> so you mentioned uh, the uh, large uh, number of patients who receive implantable defibrillators who never receive a shock from them. Uh, suggesting that there's you know, some improve, some opportunity for risk gratification even in that population. From a practical perspective, though, um, can that ever can that clock ever be turned backwards? I mean, are we can we ever come up with uh, new criteria that will exclude some of those patients from receiving an ICD? That's a great question. Can we come up with a criteria? Possibly. I don't think we can do another randomized clinical trial at all. 
you know, I could see us doing prospective cohort studies where we can look at these different markers, um, be it genetic, uh, be it cardiac MRI, be it other things that, you know, molecular profiling, as I mentioned earlier, potentially machine learning. I do believe that we can improve the process of risk predicting. Um, and so based on this information, could we perhaps come up with certain algorithms that could inform clinical practice, could inform those discussions with patients? I believe we could, uh, but I don't think that we are going to be able to like conduct randomized clinical trials where you are randomizing some of these patients to know IC. And of course, you know, some of this also, as patients become more and more involved in their care, and we are, you know, largely continuing to um, deliver patient-centered care, shared decision-making, what have you, I do believe that, like, some of the, these data can be incorporated into these discussions with patients, where you say, well, here's what we know, and that perhaps may enable them to make a more informed decision they would like us to so let's throw some numbers on that dilemma. Um, so uh, somewhere the, the numbers of people who will actually use a device appropriately once they receive it is somewhere in the order of 20 to 30 percent. However, among those who do use the device, the salvage rate or survival rate is 95 to 99 percent. So while the use is still relatively low, the benefit to those who do use it is extremely high. Okay. Thank you. Well, thank you everybody for participating in today's Grand Rounds. And we thank our special visitor from Duke, Dr. Al-Khatib in honor of um, Dr. Meyerberg uh, this afternoon. So thank you very much. Everyone have a great day. We'll see you next time. Thank week. you. Thank you. Thank you, son. Thank you.